Hey, all. Welcome to Now We're Talking with Doug Paget. Glad to have you aboard the podcast. My conversation today is with John Sweeney. He's the author of a book, Phyllis Tickle, A Life. Really excited about this conversation because Phyllis Tickle was a friend of mine, and John wrote the biography of her life. It's an extensive retelling of the work that she did, who she was as a person, why she mattered to a lot of us. So if you don't yet know Phyllis Tickle, this conversation might lead you to want to know a lot about Phyllis Tickle. She was a godmother to a lot of us in our faith and our life, and she was an inspiration and an encourager, a great person. And I learned an awful lot about Phyllis, someone who I considered a friend from John's book and from this conversation with John. So even if you feel like you've known Phyllis, the book is worth it. And if you don't feel like you know who Phyllis is or was, the book is worth it. So the book is called Phyllis Tickle, A Life. The author is John Sweeney, and here's our conversation. Thanks for being part of the podcast. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome uh, to the conversation uh, about Phyllis Tickle, A Life. Uh, that is um, a truism and also a book. And a, a book put together by John M. Sweeney. John, congratulations on the book. It's, um, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. John, it's, it, it, I, I don't know if you're calling it an authorized biography. I, I was reading some of the description of it, and it feels like you're doing something funny with the use of that word or non-use of that word. But how, how do you understand this book as, as, a, as a biography? Well, I, I never use that word, but the publisher seems to want to use that word a lot. So in all the copy promotional and otherwise that I see, I, they keep calling it authorized biography, which it was. It's just that word makes me a little bit nervous because I read a lot of biographies. And whenever I see that word, it makes me afraid that I'm about to get a book of uh, sincere devotion as opposed to something with some critical perspective. And I, I think see. anyone who reads this biography of Phil Phyllis Tickle will see not only that I admired her and that she was my friend, but that I'm sometimes, you know, even critical of certain things. So, so, so it was authorized in the sense that Phyllis certainly blessed the project and was involved before she died. Um, but it's not authorized in the sense that I sort of toe the line and just simply tell Phyllis stories without any critical perspective. I see. Yeah, okay. All right, because it, it really does feel like you have access to Phyllis's life. And um, in my experience with the book, it... it it reflects Phyllis very well. So um, I, I, I very much um, felt like... I appreciate yeah. that. I've been, I've been hearing that from a lot of people. And then the next question I always ask people is, well, did I get anything wrong? Um, right. Because I have found two little spots, and I'm not going to... There's no need to tell them to you. <laughs> <laughs> two little spots where there was some little thing to correct. Uh, but I want to make sure that, you know, I correct anything I got wrong. Well, for, for, uh, let's. I, I do want to ask you about the process of making the book because I'm fascinated by that. It's so thorough, and um, I, as someone who writes books myself, this is of a whole other style, and I, I'm very interested in that in that book making process. But say say a bit about why Phyllis mattered for you, and why you thought it was important for there to be a book that did the kind of things that um, a life. Uh, does for Phyllis um, and about Phyllis. What she wrote a lot. She was very public. Um, she she had enough books with her own name on the, on the front cover and uh, on the on the forwards. So why did you feel it was necessary to chronicle her life in such an exhaustive way that you did? She was a good friend of mine, as I know she was a good friend of yours. So she meant a great deal to me emotionally and personally. Mm -hmm. But she also meant a great great deal to me professionally, as I know she meant to you as well. Um, and our lives intersected in so many ways. I mean, she, she sat on a board of a publishing house where I, I was and still am the publisher, and I sat on boards with her because she invited me to join them. Um, we co-authored a book together towards the end of her life. Um, I published a feshrift in her honor a few years before she died. Uh, we spent a lot of time together personally, yeah. our families knew each other. So, I mean, for all those reasons, I had a personal relationship mm -hmm. to her, but I also, I sort of grew up in publishing in my twenties in the nineties when Phyllis was in her young sixties and starting at Publishers Weekly. 
and so we met at that time yeah. and in a yes. way in a way it's almost like we came together even though we were a generation apart uh, so uh, she had a profound influence on just my doing what I love to do which mm-hmm. is all about books so all of that said I loved the idea of being able to spend a couple more years with Phyllis in writing her biography. Ah. And I think that's why I said yes to doing it. I mean, I, and that's kind of a long answer to your question, but I think that's my best answer. And, and be, beyond the sort of tribute to her, you wanted to do a particular uh, telling of her life. Like there, there it's, and this feels to me obvious in the book that um, you're trying to help people to recognize for themselves uh, for their own benefit and, sort of for their deeper understanding about the, the, the work that Phyllis did, how it contributed something significant in the world, right? Like it, uh, there, there, there's a sense in which the friends of Phyllis, and there are a lot of people who feel like they're friends of Phyllis Tickle. In fact, I, I produced an event with, uh, with Tony Jones called Friends of Phyllis Tickle, and there were hundreds of people in the profession of, of religion and writing who saw themselves, understood themselves as a personal friend of Phyllis. She had that way about her, didn't she? Um, but, but you're doing something else where you want to, um, it, it feels like you're giving people access to a Phyllis that goes beyond only that sense of the personal connection that they had with her. Well, I'm glad that you have that sense from the book. I, let me say a few things because you started off what you were just saying with the word tribute. And one thing that I've been trying to make clear to audiences as I travel around and give talks about this book is that this is not a tribute book at all. When, when I started mm-hmm. doing my research, I reached out to hundreds of people, people like you, and said, can I get correspondence? Can I get your memories? Can I get whatever you know a biographer really needs for data and raw material so I can start research and writing? And I got a lot of you know thousands and thousands of emails and, and letters and things like that. But I also got a story from everybody yeah. because it was, it became clear to me yeah. that two to 300 people in the world, the day Phyllis died, there were two to 300 people in the world who believed that they were one of her best friends. And it could be that Phyllis had that kind of capacity that there actually were two to 300 people who were her best friends. I mean, if I were to die tomorrow, there'd be like three yeah, and right. one is my <laughs> wife, you know? So, I mean, <laughs> she just had this incredible capacity. But anyway, all that is to say, my response to people mm-hmm. when they would send me a story, everybody would send me a story. Here's the afternoon when Phyllis changed my life. Here's the evening when we sat drinking Jack Daniels and we had this incredible conversation. Here's the day that I went to Memphis and Phyllis and her husband, Sam, went out to dinner with us and she was so generous and fabulous. And I would respond to people and say, thank you so much for sharing that with me, but I'm not going to put that in the book because yeah. this is a this is a sort, you know, this is a literary biography. This is a critical biography. It's not a book of tributes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really helpful. And yet there is a story that's that's woven through it. And maybe that's what these styles of literary biographies are able to do is to tell a story. And I found that even that although I felt like I knew Phyllis, I didn't know this Phyllis, as it turns yeah. out. I, I really right. didn't. Um, there I don't think there, anybody did. I don't think, I mean, even, even her children, I don't think necessarily knew all of this. Phyllis. What, when did that become evident to you as a, a biographer that you were onto something of a depth and some storylines and facts and emotional spaces of Phyllis that people didn't know? When, when, when did that become evident for you? Well, it, it came to me very quickly because when you tell the stages of Phyllis's life, she had, she had a big impact on particular segments of American culture, uh, intellectual life, religious life, and they, they sort of went in stages and they weren't always connected. Hmm. So, I mean, her first level of impact was in the public schools in Tennessee and in teaching as a professor in Tennessee. Um, and that happened before she became a poet of note, Right. The Southern poet of note in Tennessee. I mean, there's poems of hers that are inscribed in stone in Tennessee state parks. Is that true? And then that happened. Yeah. Wow. In Nashville, Tennessee. And then, and then that happened before she became a book publisher, a very prominent regional Southern book publisher and a voice in favor of Southern literature. And all of that happened before she ever went to Publishers Weekly and founded the religion department, which is when I met her. Mm-hmm. 
And then all of that happened before, again, that was in that decade of the 90s, she had a huge impact on religion and spirituality in America, and she was on television, uh, you know, every week. And then that happened before she compiled The Divine Hours, and that's what a lot of people yeah. then, you know, when you're starting to catch up now with people in their adult life now, and that's what most right. people know about her. And then that happened, you know, before she wrote The Shaping of a Life, her autobiography, which had a big impact on people. And then that happened in large part before she started doing all the stuff on emerging Christianity and emergence Christianity and the emerging church. And she started traveling the way that she did for 20 years. So, I mean, she had these stages of her life and no one really could have kept up with all of it. Yeah. And did you ever think about the, the title, The Multiple Lives of Phyllis Tickle? Like, was that something <laughs> you were toying with? Because it does feel like there were these different... St- no, no, honestly, it wasn't. I mean, it never occurred to me because I was thinking I wanted to tell the story of, of the life. And, yeah. and I mean, everything I just said is mostly professional, I suppose. But I also weave in there a lot of relationships because, like all of us, she had complicated relationships. Right. Um, so that's part of it. I mean, it's a full, it's a full picture, I think. So my, my experience with her was that her professional work, which is how we became friends. I mean, she was a, she was a, a legend on my bookshelf with the divine hours. And I remember my experience with, with her writings there and thinking, this is a person who just functions at a whole other level than I do. I mean, she felt very advanced in spirituality and otherworldly to me. Then when I met her, and got to know her, it felt like, oh, no, this is like a drinking buddy. Like, uh, she would, uh, she was so personal and so close and so earthy. And it, it felt like there were there, I, I got this inside scoop, which might be why I felt like, like I was, you know, this friend, uh, of hers. I felt like I was having access to this other side. What I realized though, is that for, at least when I met her, you know, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s, that Phyllis was the, the difference between her professional work and relationships weren't different. She used, um, relationships were part of her professional work in that way. And there was a period of time where I thought, oh, I'm getting access to the inside Phyllis by this relationship and this friendliness and this insider. And then I began to realize, oh, that is how she does her professional work. So that's my observation. Was she that way, uh, in the earlier years of her life? Was she so incredibly, personable and personal in the public work that she did? She was. In fact, I'll give you an example that's not in the book. So I was in Memphis just a couple of weeks ago giving a few talks and a bookstore event for this book. And at the bookstore event, I deliberately chose a sort of smaller bookstore in Memphis where I knew that Phyllis had had a long relationship Mm -hmm. with the bookseller and Phyllis had done a bunch of events there in the past. In fact, one of Phyllis's kids had actually worked there for a decade. And it was very sweet. It was a very sweet evening. And one of her authors, Phyllis's authors from when she was the publisher at St. Luke's Press, which is a press that she founded back in the early 70s. Incredible. And one of the books that she was very proud of that she published in the late 70s, which I talk about briefly in my book, that author was there at the signing and introduced herself to me. And I quickly showed her where her name was in the index of the back of the book. And she was delighted. But she briefly told me that when she was doing the research for her book, that Phyllis went with her on a research trip to another state. And she, she quickly said this to me in the course of conversation, and I kind of stopped her and said, wait a minute, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. You're saying that when you were researching the book that Phyllis contracted you to publish as your publisher, that she actually like got in the car and went with you on the research trip? And she said, oh, yeah, she was so interested in what I was writing about, and she had a personal interest in it. And by the way, this was, an, this was a book about... Cherokee, Cherokee life and how dramatically it has changed in a hundred years um, and various other things. So Phyllis was with her for a long weekend on a research trip. I mean, this is so, I mean, she was incredible. doing that back in the seventies. She was doing exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. In- incredible. That, that is, um, did, did you feel, do you feel like you understood anything about in the writing of the book that you didn't understand in your, in your relationship about Phyllis that explained her capacity to do this, to think on s- about so many topics on so many levels and be so present to those issues that she was working on at the time. Uh, do, do you have any clue of, of what it was about her temperament or personality or skills or, I don't know, magic or whatever it was that made that possible? You know, I, I don't. 
I mean, as you're asking the question, I'm trying to think of an answer, and I don't really, except just to say how remarkable it was and yeah. what a gift it was. I mean, she had a gift for friendship. She had she had an approach, and there's a whole chapter in the book. The, the, the chapter where I talk about the divine hours and the creation of those books is a chapter where I weave in Phyllis's mystical life, which was one of the surprising things to me and will be to many readers, I think. And in that chapter is where I really start to talk about the way that Phyllis had this real sense of wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had this way of entering the world every day, uh, feeling and experiencing the world as if she's living among amazing things. Yeah. And she told her own story when she wrote autobiographically, she often told her own story that way in a way that if you were a literary critic, you would be critical of it. And in fact, in my biography, there's a couple spots where I am kind of critical of it because she says things that aren't entirely factually true, Sure, but it's the way she entered the world. I mean, she had this sense of wow. Yeah. And so maybe that explains it. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's incredible. She had this ability to be very present to people's stories and then also maintain her own professional shtick, right? Like I've heard Phyllis give presentations, I don't know, countless times. I really, uh, uh, so yeah. many times. And she could stay on script and say those same things over and over. And so one part of her brain was like that person that could just nail it in front of a crowd. You'd put a camera on her and say, go in recording. And she, we used to refer to her as one cut Phyllis. She would just nail it the first time she held it. But then she would be so present. And so many of us feel like that's a trade off we're having to make. Uh, you know, there's this, there's this old saying that uh, authenticity is key. Once you can fake that, you've got it made. And, and I used to think Phyllis <laughs> somehow has this ability to uh, fake the authenticity but she wasn't faking at all. She could just shape shift between being so present and authentic and listen to you. And then also turn on the, this is the thing I need to do and say at this very moment and make these presentations happen. That, that was remarkable. And at the same time, what yeah. I learned in your book is yeah. Yeah. she was holding an awful lot of pain and secret that others didn't know about. Um, and, and so I, I want to ask you about that when, when it be, um, there are a number of, of revelations that the book makes and, uh, or that her stories uh, of her, of her life that, that, that come out in the book. And, um, they're shocking to some of us as friends. Like how did we, how did we not know these things about Phyllis? Um, did you, well, I guess I have two questions for you. One is, are there more things that you know that aren't in the book? And secondly, how did you go about deciding what you would share that other people didn't know that you felt like was fair game uh, in the book? And, and, and let's talk about a few of those. Yeah. Well, so, so the first question, there isn't, there, there isn't more that I know in terms of revelations that are not in the book. There's more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to, I was sort of a word count limited uh, as an author, really? You know what exactly what, what was I'm the word about. count? One hundred and fifty thousand words, uh, because this uh, is a... <laughs> ninety five thousand words, okay. I believe. Ninety five thousand, and I had to argue with the publisher to get that many. Yeah, <laughs> I I wanted to write a book that was bigger, you know, because I wow. read a lot of biographies, and I I was saying things like, you know, you got to have one hundred and twenty thousand words for this to be a substantive book, but I, I got as much as ninety five thousand words, so. Anyway, I had to often, you know, tell something in two paragraphs that I would have preferred to have taken three pages to mm -hmm. do. So there's more detail, but there aren't necessarily revelations that I didn't include. Yeah. And in terms of how to decide what to include, that was a very difficult process. And I think it was a very difficult process for two reasons. One, because there are people who are still living who are important to consider their feelings. And I think a biographer always has to deal with that. Mm. And I think the second thing is that Phyllis was my dear friend, you know, so I was concerned also for how people would perceive her. And I had to just sort of get over that second one in a way. Yeah. I had to I had to decide that I was going to be honest and tell the faithful story. And I know that that's what Phyllis would want me to do anyway. But I, of course, had to do it with tact. So there's a primary revelation, and maybe I should wait until you ask me. Well, I don't know. I was... There's a primary one that... And I can speak to how I uh, dealt with that. One. Uh, okay, so I uh, let's let's talk about that. Um, so there was a primary revelation that struck me uh, as important, and 
I've been trying to figure out this morning, like, and I've asked a couple of friends of mine, I wonder how I should broach this subject with John. Like how, because, and there's one part of me that was, um, look, it's, it's, it's public. It's in the book. It's out there. Um, just, just talk about it. Just ask him about it. But then I don't want to be the one, uh, who reveals it was my, was my hesitation because I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm not the one that made this public. John's the one that made this public. And so (laughs) you know how I felt. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and that's what I wanted to ask you about, you know, while, while we continue to sort of beat around this bush until we, uh, you know, wear, wear down the grass that, um, before we tell people what the, what the revelation is, um, the, um, did you feel, uh, how did you deal with that conflict internally of, am I going to be the one that's going to write this sentence in this particular way? Um, uh, because it not only, it didn't only involve Phyllis, it involved Sam. Well, at least that's the issue I'm talking about. I mean, we, we haven't even talked about this to know, but, um, it, it, it's not really about Phyllis per se. It's really, uh, about the impact of Phyllis's relationship with Sam, her husband. All right, so so the, the revelation that we're talking about is is the fact that Sam was uh, bisexual, and that Sam had relationships outside of their marriage with men that Phyllis knew about. So he, it turned out that Phyllis made it easy on me. Oh, because when you get to the sentence where I reveal this for the first time in the book. And I don't have the book in front of me, but it's on page, it's like 152 or 154 or something like that. Yep. When you get to that sentence, it's at the very bottom of the page. I know that it, I know that it's the last thing on the page. There's an end note call out. Yep. And if you turn to the note at the back of the book, which is the source for the quote that I've just quoted, which is an email from Sam to a third party. Mm-hmm in which Sam says something to the effect of, I mean, I didn't memorize it, but it says something to the effect of Phyllis knows that I, that I need men and that I sometimes have a man and she's usually friends with them and she's okay with it. Right. If if you go to the note at the back of the book, it says something to the effect of a printout of this email was in a file folder in Phyllis's desk when she died. And so now I'll add to what that note says in the book to to explain to you that Phyllis was involved with me in recent, well, not in the research, but in interviews before she died, knowing that I was writing her biography. I, I, I was able to have two or three months with her of extensive interviews, questions. Um, and she knew that when she died, the contents of her desk were going to be put into a couple of boxes and sent to my house because that was part of my research. And so she left, she left in a manila folder, in a manila folder, Mm -hmm. a single piece of paper in the top desk drawer. And so when I opened up this box of materials, I read this email, obviously, and it shocked me. And I immediately then tried to verify it with different people, but she gave it to me. Wow. So it was interesting that in our interviews and in our conversations, she didn't offer this to me, Mm -hmm. did not want to talk about it, I suppose, but she gave me the source. And so in that note, if you go to the back of the book, you see that, and and this partly answers your question too of how did I decide to handle it? It says Sam Tickle writing to, and then I have brackets that say uh, recipient, uh, you know, not to be disclosed because there's no, I'm I'm not in the, I'm not interested in outing anybody. And so I don't need to say who Sam was writing to. Um, But I was, I guess I was, you know, in essence, sort of outing Sam, but there were, there were 10 or 20 people who knew about this. It was not a secret in the family. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that was talked about a lot, but it wasn't a secret. Yeah, you, it just you, was unknown to the rest of us. I, I will say, I, I thought it was uh, a very elegant way to make this revelation. Um, even the way that it unfolds in the story as a larger sense of Sam's professional and personal concern for people struggling with HIV and AIDS, and Sam's care for, as you put it, uh, that Sam grew up uh, always. 
attracted to the depressives, neurotics, misfits, and those who hurt and felt excluded. And then you well, and said, because Sam's beauty. I that's mean, how yes. Sam sees himself because he was one of them. And yes. it, it, I think what shocked so what shocked me, and I think what strikes so many of us is what you capture in this in this other sentence where uh, at the end of that that section where you say, by the end of Sam's life, Sam being uh, Phyllis's husband, for those who can't follow all this, all of his children would know about his sexual identity, whether or not they wanted to believe it. It seems that none of Phyllis's friends were aware, although it was often evidence from the comments that she would make about her husband. And then you go on. And I think what struck so many uh, of us who I've talked to about this, who were friends of Phyllis, was the fact that we didn't know that. And, and that's its own interesting piece, right, where you realize that what's shocking uh, is that that's a really big deal. Phyllis could have made a lot out of it in her professional life. There was maybe a point where uh, her advocacy for LGBTQ peoples could have really been bolstered by her making public this. But she chose not to and kept it from other people. Uh, and so the revelation was both um, – recognizing how difficult life must have been on Sam having to live in such a closeted way because you say that it was years into their marriage before he made this this evident to, to Phyllis. So there was that personal pain, but also the realization there was a whole lot more going on with them than any of us knew, and it, it deepened our, my sense of who Phyllis was and how she operated and what she carried in the world. Yeah. Yes, and I think it also deepened what a lot of us knew about Phyllis and Sam's experience at a church in Memphis called Holy Trinity Community Church, where, you know, we were often hearing how, yeah. even though she was Episcopalian and she was a lay Eucharistic minister and a lector in her church, that she deliberately didn't go to the sort of established churches, yeah. uh, Episcopal churches in Memphis, and she chose to go to this sort of outline church that was focused almost exclusively in its ministry and its membership uh, on the LGBTQ community. And she was passionately involved there, wanted it to become an Episcopal church. It ended up becoming a UCC congregation. But part of what this revelation explains in the narrative of Phyllis's life is their involvement there and the fact that Sam felt so comfortable there. That's right. Yeah. It, it answered those. It started to, the pieces started to lay together um, for me as I knew that, that story of their lives. Yeah. And I guess it's the kind of this realization that we never know the burden that one another uh, are, are carrying. We don't, we don't have access to all the pieces that make up our lives and it's our choice of what we're going to share and how we're going to share it. So it's, it's, it's helpful for me to hear that backstory of how you, how you came upon this information. I, I wondered if Phyllis had, had let you in on it, um, in her, in her dying days or, um, uh, if you stumbled upon it and the way that I felt that I stumbled upon it, you know, be because, you let me in on it, but very subtly. Yeah, because I actually heard it from a friend who said, hey, there's some, there's a revelation in there. Have you seen it? And I was like, well, I know some things about Phyllis that everyone doesn't make, that maybe aren't so public, but it was nothing like this. Um, and, and so it felt like it was uh, an opening and a realization about who Phyllis was and what she carried for, for a, a lot of years and her own um, a willingness to keep her personal and family life open and accessible but it was not a prop for her for her content and um that's a that's a lot of decision for for a person to have to live with and have to make she she carried a lot but but the it's it's curious because like i even think about myself and why that's such a big deal and i'm like why do i think that's such a big deal it it it's not really it carries a lot of significance for phyllis but there's so much more um, that's not at all implicated by that revelation that her marriage was not um, the the one that a lot of us thought that it was. Because there was a sense that that Phyllis kind of gave off this, hey, I'm a Southern wife. I'm uh, I'm fulfilling my commitment. I've got, you know, I have all these children and I've got to take care of all that. And these these um, gender roles, they really they really get in the way. And and and, and we all have to work hard to 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 clear the clear the deck of the of the struggle that uh, is implied well, inside these gender roles. Yeah. I was just thinking of that too. And I, I was just thinking of, you remember all the times when she used to say that, uh, I mean, she didn't say it in exactly this way, but she would essentially say, even though my life in many ways is a, is a perfect example of second wave feminism. Yeah. 
I've been faithful to this man for so many decades and had seven children with him. So I don't get to call myself that. Yeah. I mean, you remember she used to yeah, say oh, all the like time. That, but mm-hmm. I think, I think, I think the complicatedness of the relationship with Sam helps to explain that too. Yeah. So, so talk to me a bit more about how a book like this comes together. You said you, you had all of these correspondence and there are so many, I I mentioned to you just before we started that you tell some stories in the book that I was involved with that I don't have the level of memory about that uh, are detailed in the book. It's, it's incredible. The amount of the, the amount of pieces that you had to bring together over a long span of time to narrate this story. And so how did you choose to, um, how did, how did you approach that work as it served to tell the particular story of the the life of Phyllis Tickle? Well, you you know, most biographies are built upon either diaries, you know, journal entries or, and, or correspondence. So I quickly found out that Phyllis did not keep a journal or a diary of any kind, and Sam didn't either. So I wasn't going to have access to that kind of thing. So I knew that correspondence was going to be so important. So I started reaching out to everybody I could think of, uh, asking for uh, you know old-fashioned letters from the 60s and 70s and 80s, but then also emails. And I got lucky with some people who actually archived their emails and things. I mean, if anyone were to ever ask me for that, I would be of very little use because I'm not sophisticated in those areas and I delete things very quickly. So, and, and I, and I bumped into some people like that who said, I'm really sorry, but I, I don't have that, or I didn't save those things or I'll find what I can. And they would send me, you know, half a dozen, but I had other people who had archived them and had uh, decades in Mm -hmm. some cases, uh, you know, from like the mid nineties until 2015 Mm -hmm. of thousands of emails from Phyllis. So I ended up uh, with, I don't know, probably 75 to 80 people who sent me substantive huh. amounts of correspondence. And I was able to kind of use that as the backbone. And, and you started this biography project before Phyllis died. Uh, how, yes. how long of a process was it to, to bring all of this together? And, and, and how, do, how do you, when did you know I'm going to write this story about Phyllis in a biography format and start to, to bring that together uh, and then when did you start writing? Like, how does that process work as a biographer? Well, her diagnosis was about three years ago this April, mm. three three years ago mm. next month. And it was pretty soon after that that I decided to write the book. And, oh. and that happened because a friend in publishing said to me, uh, well, no, sorry, there's another step before that. When Phyllis's diagnosis was set um, and announced, actually before it was announced, we, she established a literary trust. Phyllis was always terrifically smart about things like this. So she established a literary trust of three people. And I was one of those three people. So I don't even, I don't even know what a literary trust is. Can, can you, can you explain to me what a literary trust is? Literary trust meaning that after she's dead, after she's gone, there are people who are responsible for making decisions about how her content is going to be used. Oh. You know, so if you if you wanted to compile a collection of Phyllis Tickle's writings, you'd have to get our permission to do it. I That's see. all it means. So so it's not ju- it doesn't go to the family the way that the other other well, will, will one items. of those three people is one of uh, Phyllis's children, okay. Sam Tickle Jr. Yeah. Okay. So I mean the family's involved. Yeah. All right. But quickly then after that was announced and Phyllis's diagnosis was announced and everyone started to talk about, you know, Phyllis's death, which would come relatively soon, Mm -hmm. a friend of mine in publishing said, are you going to write her biography? And I had never written a biography before. I mean, it never would have occurred to me to write her biography. And the first thing I thought was that. The second thing I thought was Phyllis would hate this idea. You know, (laughs) So, so... so I called her and thinking that she was going to totally poo poo it. Yeah. And the fact that she didn't and the fact that she actually said, oh, oh that's interesting. I immediately thought, OK, well, just the fact that she didn't poo poo yeah. it means I should do this. Yeah. And so I decided to do it. So but then to answer your question of how long it took, I had to sort of judge how long should I take and how short are people's memories, because mm. I find it. I find it common in life and I, it's been confirmed since the book came out. Our memory is very short these days. 
Um, it's been shocking to me what people don't remember about Phyllis, and she hasn't even been dead for three years. Right. So I'm actually glad that I stopped, did, and that the book came out, you know, relatively quickly for that reason. Yeah. As you tell people uh, who don't know Phyllis so well, right, uh, unlike the, the sort of friend fan club that I feel that I'm a, a, a part of, when you tell someone else that you've written a book about Phyllis Tickle and they say, oh, who's Phyllis Tickle? How do you now describe the Phyllis Tickle that you wrote a book about? How do you tell someone who doesn't know about who she is, uh, who this person is that was worth writing a biography of? Well, I usually combine the personal with the general. I mean, the personal being that she had a big impact on me because I got into publishing in the early 90s, right when she founded the Religion Department of Publishers Weekly. And she was one of the couple of people in this country who had the biggest influence on the way in which God was cool in the 90s. (laughs) And it had a big impact on my life and my work. She was the public God Um, representative. But then I say something. Yeah. But then I say something much more broad, which is, you know, she was one of the most important women in religion in the late second half of the 20th century, Hmm. but not just in religion, but in literary life, Um, a poet, a publisher, Mm -hmm. uh, a public uh, figure, a public intellectual. And then I talk about the various stages of her life, kind of like I mentioned earlier, as a, you know, as a professor and as a publisher and as a poet and um, all the ways in which she had a profound influence. But I mean, all that said, I had a friend, you know, at a dinner recently asking me that kind of question. You know, there's always the friend at dinner who says, you know, what are you working on and what's your new book or whatever. And I remember saying to my friend, you know, that all that said, it's not as if, you know, a biography of Phyllis Tickle has the appeal that a biography of Desmond Tutu would have or something. Because, I mean, she wasn't sort of figure on the world stage, Uh, but she has a lot of pockets of serious fans and people who she has mm-hmm. had a lasting influence on. And that's the audience for the book. Excellent. Hey, you, you write the book in a way that has these numbers uh, over the different sections. Every chapter seems to have uh, a one, two, three, four, five, six in them. Can, can you talk a bit about that structure and w- what you're doing for the reader's purpose in, in numbering the sections through the course of the chapters? Um, I guess my best answer is that I, 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 I have seen other books that do that, of course. It's not like I invented it, but there's something a little more elegant about that approach than using what we in publishing call A-heads. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. meaning, you know, meaning a two or three word, uh, you know, sort of head, heading for the next section. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give the sections little names. Yeah. There was something more elegant about numbers. And it also it allows the reader to make a transition, but yet they do kind of build upon each other within each chapter. Yeah, because the chapters are complex and um, and your writing is I don't know if you've heard this, John, but you're a good writer. I don't know if people have told you that before, but uh, you're 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 very, very uh, elegant and sophisticated writer. And you tell this story in such a um, a, a subtle way. There's a there's a there's a gentleness to the to the reveals that happen in the in the storylines and and the introduction of the numbers there i hadn't seen that before in 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 books um was a is a is a really nice way to um say to the reader uh there's a there, there's multiple things going on in this area of phyllis's life and and i i found that to be a really a really intriguing way to engage the book I think you can get away with the numbering in a sort of more literary book, like a biography. Mm -hmm. You can't usually get away with that in a work of spirituality where you're supposed to be, um, you know, reminding people of the takeaway, you know, in a biography, there's not so much a takeaway. There's more just a narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think it can work in that kind of a book. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It's, um, it's excellent. I think it's a great tribute to Phyllis's life um, and really helpful for people who, who want to, because I'm around people who feel like they want Phyllis's life not to be a piece of art that they admire only. They feel like they want to be inspired by Phyllis, right? They, they want it to impact their own life in a certain way. 
and we all have our own experiences with either her writings or her thoughts or uh, her her talks or her friendship. Um, and it's sometimes hard to uh, utilize those little snippets as some kind of a influence on your life path. And this book really does that in a way. It gives someone a more full sense of the, the Phyllis that someone might have run into in 2008 um, didn't come yes. into being in 2007, right? It was, it was a long yes. build to becoming that person. Yes. And um, what was that's a great what, way to put it. Yes. What was that part of your intention was for the people who find her to be meaningful to allow her uh, story to become much bigger and um, sort of less attainable in one way and more less attainable attain- in another? Yes, I wanted I mean, I, I really thought and I, I, I would imagine I was right about, about this, that the, the, the typical reader of this book is going to be someone who only knew Phyllis from what, what I would call the last two stages of her life. Yeah. Um, the divine hours influence and the emergence Christianity influence. Most people who read the book don't even necessarily remember or knew the Phyllis of Publishers Weekly in the 90s. Yeah. But even if they did, that's only the last three stages since she was 60 years old. I know. So I wanted them to have a bigger picture of who she was. Yeah. I, I remember saying something to Phyllis, and maybe I wrote in, in a book, maybe the one you put together, that, uh, that Phyllis Tick- Tickle in my life reminded me of Bob Barker, who was the, you know, the host yeah. of, of uh, uh, The Price is Right. And I realized that Bob Barker didn't start hosting that show until he was like 50 years old. Like all of my experience of him was that stage of his life. And it was so encouraging to believe that a person could have a life that would be so full in those later years that, and Phyllis really represented that. Um, And you give access to that earlier, those earlier years um, that I think had so much to do with who she was um, in her, in her sixties and seventies and early eighties. So, yeah. And, and, you know, that said, um, I mean, maybe this is a good, I don't know, concluding thought, but one of the coolest things about Phyllis, I think, is that when she was in her seventies and eighties, she had so many fans who were in their twenties. Yeah. And it's because I'm sure it's because she was such a straight talker, you know, yeah. uh, particularly when you're in your twenties, you only want to be around people who are straight talkers. Like don't flower yeah. things. Don't waste my time. She was a straight talker. She was a great listener. And you knew that no matter what age you were. So yeah. there was a way in which she was kind of ageless That's in right. her appeal. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, I hope the book is ageless as well, my friend. So congratulations, and people should pick it up. Thank Phyllis you. Tickle, A Life, John Sweeney. Are you traveling uh, to other places with the book? Are you, are you hitting the road and telling people about it, anywhere they, people could meet you or get together? I've been doing together? quite a bit. I was, at, I was at Trinity Church Wall Street just yesterday in New York, uh, and I w- I've been in Memphis, and where else have I? I'm going to be in Ann Arbor next month. I'm going to be in Atlanta at the Cathedral in May. Uh, so I've been a few places, and I've got a few more. And yeah. if and if people are in those places or want to invite you, is there a place they can stay in touch with you and see where you're going to well, be or invite you to join them somewhere? I suppose Facebook's probably the best for me. I mean, I have a website, johnmsweeney.com, but I don't keep it up to date with those kinds of things. So uh, Facebook's probably best. Great. And John M. Sweeney on Facebook as well. And Twitter, John M. Sweeney. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's- well, hey, buddy, congr- congratulations. Thanks, and thanks for... Uh, Thanks for chatting today. Many thanks. So there you go. A fun conversation with that fun person. Hey, thanks for being a part of the podcast, everyone. If you're interested in being a supporter of what I do in the podcast and every other audio and video that I put out in the world, I ask people to become patrons through a website called Patreon. It's a place where you can contribute financially to make all this happen. I think it's an extra little treat 